Washington just wins again, and yet a lot of people in the country don't seem to care. Well, in the Pac-12, we do, of course. You are Locked On Pac-12, your daily podcast on the Pac-12 Conference. It's the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On Pack 12. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with our media rights and soon to be mostly team free. But until then, beloved and loaded Conference of Champions. Like, comment, subscribe, rate, review, please, and thank you wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 if your team wins. Visit fanduelcom slash locked on to get started. Good to be back with you here on the show. I wanted to do a Saturday night show, but let me tell you, that wouldn't have gone well for anybody involved. But Saturday went pretty well for Washington. We'll get to the rest of our winners and losers here, but we haven't seen the next edition of the college football playoff rankings. The committee has demonstrated to this point they don't care about Washington the way they should. So we out here in the Pac-12 have watched Washington for the last couple of years. Kalen DeBoer's career record as a head coach, by the way, at three different stops is 101 and 11, which is bonkers. Absolutely, positively bonkers. But that aside, Washington has been doing nothing but winning week after week after week after week. And sometimes they win running the ball a lot, like against USC. Sometimes they win throwing the ball a lot, like they did against, I don't know, a number of opponents this year. Sometimes they win with a good amount of balance, like they did against Oregon. Sometimes they win a low-scoring game, like against Arizona State. Sometimes they win a high-scoring game, like against USC. And here was Washington. Everything was set up for Oregon State to win that game. I thought Oregon State would win going into it. Oregon State was favored for a reason. The Beavs are a great home team. They're a good team overall, and the rain was cascading down. So here's a team whose offense is predicated around a Heisman contending quarterback, the best passing offense with an elite trio of wide receivers in the country. You're on the road, hostile environment, great team on the other side, and the rain is coming down. Everything on the outside there, in theory, on paper, sets up for Washington to lose. And guess what? They just won again because that's all they've been doing. They haven't lost. It's been over a year since they've lost a football game. They just keep winning. Doesn't matter who the opponent is, what the style is, or anything like that. Everybody out West recognizes that. I really, really hope. And I don't know how high my confidence level is, but hopefully it comes to fruition. I really hope the college football playoff committee starts to recognize that Washington's really good, and that finding a way to win in a variety of styles is a testament to a team, not an inherent drawback. And I think so far, it's been levied against Washington as a criticism. Well, you know, you don't look the same every week, like right? Like since the loss to Washington, Oregon has looked the same every week where they've been better than their opponents on both sides of the ball. And they've played like it. They've played like it every week. But Washington's games have all looked a little bit different. And the committee apparently to this point thinks that's a bad thing. Now, I'm not happy that Jordan Travis went down with an injury for Florida State. I think that stinks because he's a really good player, and Florida State is a very good team. There's no world in which Washington should be outside the top four after the Seminoles trailed at home to an FCS team. And I'm here to tell you, for those of you who aren't caught up on North Alabama football, it's not a good one. They're not a good FCS team. Not this year. Maybe they have been in the past. But I do play-by-play in the conference they play in, the newly minted United Athletic Conference, North Alabama, bottom of the league. They were supposed to be that before the year. They have been that so far this season, which is now over for for them. I'm pretty sure. For all intents and purposes, it is. That team was beating Florida State by 13 points in Tallahassee. That alone should put Washington ahead, who just went and won an ugly road game against a great team, slugged it out 22 to 20. You know what great teams do? They find a way to win. You know what Washington just keeps on doing? Finding a way to win. Favorite, underdog, doesn't matter. 
They're favored most of the time. They weren't favored on Saturday. And guess what? They won anyway. They won anyway because that's what they've been doing. Hopefully the committee takes notice that winning at Oregon State is more impressive than beating North Alabama at home. And also if they clearly work in the eye test, quote unquote, which Florida State hasn't passed, by the way, in any way, shape or form. The eye test would tell you that a team that was losing by two possessions to a bad FCS team at home is not as good as their record indicates. So Washington should be in. We'll see if they will be. They're the biggest winner from week 12. Yeah, that, that, that much I think is pretty darn clear. Biggest game in all of college football. Washington walks away with the win. Yeah, they're the big winner. They're not the only outright winner this week as we get to our weekly during the season winners and losers segment where I assess how I think each fan base should feel based on their team's performance in week 12. The other outright winner this week, which is the highest label one can attain, is Arizona. That was a thumping. I didn't think that 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 that, that had all the makings of a Utah special. They they haven't lost two games in a row in conference play in three years. They were coming off a game in which they played Washington very well on the road. Arizona it was you know maybe trying to find their way between being a great team or a great story. Nope, they're a really good team, which we knew, but I didn't know that they were. Yeah, we're going to come out and put up the first 28 points in the game on Utah good. So they keep their Pac-12 championship hopes alive. If they win this week and Oregon State wins this week, Washington will play Arizona in the Pac-12 title game. Crazy how that works. That's a heck of a week for Arizona. That's a heck of a performance against a good football team and a good, and a great football coach. Kyle Whittingham does not get trounced very easily. He got trounced on Saturday. His entire staff, they got pantsed. I mean, they they were absolutely outplayed in all three phases across the board. Arizona was better. They dominated them. I didn't think that was going to happen. That's the first time that an outcome for a specific game has fallen outside of my range of outcomes that I've been doing going into every week. So good for Arizona. They're an outright winner this week. Four teams in the lean win department. I think that Cal picked up, you know, I say this is the biggest Cal Bears fan on this particular show, obviously. Cal not only beat Stanford for the third year in a row, but keeps their hopes of making a bowl game alive. I tell you, if they beat UCLA this week, which I'm like this close to predicting, even though it's on the road, I'm going to be among the most obnoxious podcast hosts in all of college football. That is, I can I can just guarantee you that right here, right now. I can also guarantee you that if you're a college student, you need to listen up. There's this incredible app called listening.com, which can take any academic paper, PDF, or class material and turn it into an audio book. It can read math equations, technical words, and complicated documents. It knows how to skip all the citations, footnotes, and references, all that stuff, and let you jump straight to the chapter section you want to listen to. It even has a one-click note-taking button where it automatically puts the last 10 seconds into a notepad, so you don't have to type notes while you listen. This is going to make your work life easier if you're a college student out there. Best of all, if you use the link listening.com slash locked on, if you go right there, you'll be able to get your first three weeks for free. So you can try it out, see how it works, get a feel for the one note feature, and you can do everything that you need. First three weeks are free if you go to listening.com slash locked on. So go ahead, give it a try. What do you got to lose? absolutely positively nothing. It's usually two weeks free. That's what that's what they normally do is they say, hey, we'll give you a two week free trial. But guess what? Because you support this show and the Lockdown Podcast Network, which I and many others greatly appreciate, you get an extra free week when you go to listening.com slash locked on. That's listening.com slash locked on for a free three week trial. Go to listening.com. Okay, so my obvious Cal homerism aside, the Bears played well. I didn't put that in the Pac-12 prime picks because I didn't know if they'd cover the six and a half on the road. They did. 27-15, the final in uh, Palo Alto. That's a pretty darn good feeling for Justin Wilcox right now. Now, one particular podcast host, maybe the host of this one, I can't really recall. Everything's very fuzzy right now. You know, I'm a little sick and everything's just... Fugazi, Fugazi, it's a wazi, it's a woozy, it's fairy dust. So, great movie. 
Wolf of Wall Street, for those of you who don't know, most of you probably did. I hope you did. Anyway, back in the spring when cows over under four and a half came out, I told you to hammer the over. It moved to five and a half. And then I said, I don't know. That's a little iffy. I don't know if I touched that. And guess what? They're at five wins going into their last game of the regular season. Funny how that works. So cows in the lean win department because they stay alive for bowl eligibility. Oregon is in the lean win department here, not because of how they played. You know, they obliterated Arizona State. I expected that to happen. My game prediction was 45 to 13. The final score was 49 to 13. So that's about what I expected. Oregon's in the lean win department here because they got what they needed from their neighbors to the north. And that was Washington. They needed Washington to win so that everything hold steady, and in theory it will, in the college football playoff rankings. If Washington had lost to Oregon State with the way the Pac-12 and the West Coast has been disrespected over and over and over again, I think a Washington loss in that spot could have really shaken things up. It shouldn't have, but now we'll never know because Washington won the game. So that sets the stage, I think, for Oregon to have a clearer and more identifiable path and a more assured path to get to the college football playoff if they win their next two games. Oregon State this week in the game formerly, but now renowned as the Civil War. I don't know if we're renaming that or not. I prefer the term Civil War, but I, I don't know. I don't make these decisions. If they win that game, they play Washington in the Pac-12 championship game. If they win that one and give the Huskies their first loss of the season, that more than likely would get Oregon in. But the outside help is why Oregon is a lean win right there. Washington State. It's a lean win here, but they snapped the losing skid. I'm happy for the Cougs. Everybody up in Pullman that listens to or watches the show, you should feel good about that one. You sent your seniors off right in a season that has not gone as planned. Not re- They have not lived up to their full potential this year. But going into the Apple Cup, and hey, it's a rivalry. Anything could happen. The line's opened at 15 and a half. Could be worse. You have a chance to make a bowl game. Now, Do I think Washington State can win the game? (laughs) That's a tough one. (laughs) Washington's very good. We'll talk about that more later in the week. But for now, Washington State obliterates Colorado. It's Colorado, you know? So it's it's not an outright win, but snapping the losing streak, that feels good. Winning on senior day, that feels good. Having a chance for bowl eligibility. Good vibes up in Pullman for the first time in seven weeks. Yikes. How about UCLA? And I'm going to get to Chip Kelly here in a, in a moment once we finish our weekly winners and losers segment. But UCLA goes into, I thought USC was going to roll here. I loved USC. They were my favorite bet of the week. And um, that, that didn't go very well. Lincoln Riley just went seven and five. That's his worst ever record. Yes, I just hit my hand on the desk. That's his worst ever record in a full season of college football. Pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. I thought USC would be a lot closer to 10 wins than than six, but turns out they end the regular season with seven, and we've probably seen Caleb Williams play football, college football for the last time. But UCLA, they win a rivalry game. What does that mean for Chip Kelly? Stay tuned. No vibe this week. Three teams, Stanford, Colorado, Arizona State. I expected Colorado to lose and not cover. I expected Stanford to lose. I expected Arizona State to lose big. Those things all happen. Those teams are all at points in their season where it's, you know, build for the future, look ahead, try to maybe win in rivalry week, which it was for Stanford. But I didn't have big expectations for any of those teams. I don't think they should have either. Cal's a better team than Stanford. Wazoo's a better team at their peak than Colorado. Shadur Sanders got injured and whatnot. And Colorado's got a lot of work to do. And they can do that this offseason, but they, you know, certainly going to have to put it in. Lean lose this week. Utah. Only because their chances of making the Pac-12 championship game were pretty slim. I, I thought about going outright loser here, but like that's that's why I didn't put them there is because eh, they probably weren't making the Pac-12 championship game anyway. So Utah's a lean lose, pretty hard lean lose though, because to go down to Arizona and not be competitive, ay, 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 that wasn't good. And Utah's now got four losses on the year. It's just going to be a continual thinking of what if. What if Cam Rising been healthy? But there's the good news. And this could almost get upgraded to a no vibe. Cam Rising is coming back. That makes Utah the favorites in the Big 12 going into 2024. Have to be. Absolutely have to be. USC, lean lose. 
you know, their goals had already been lost, but losing to your rival who was thinking about firing their coach at home by 18 points, that's not that's that's not great. But the biggest stakes for USC, they'd already been lost this year. That's why it's a lean lose. And it's a lean lose for the Pac-12 prime picks. My streak of three straight winning weeks came to a close. Two and three. I'm one game over 500 on the year. A couple of weeks left. Hopefully we'll be able to continue finishing strong. And the only outright loser for the week, Oregon State. It was billed as the biggest game in Corvallis in quite a while because it was. And Oregon State in their three losses this year have lost them by three points, three points, and two points. It sucks to be a beaver after that particular outcome. It does. I think a lot of Oregon State fans feel that way. I think that environment was awesome. I don't know how any, anybody to here's the redeeming quality of that loss for Oregon State, which removes them from the Pac-12 championship picture, right? They can't make it. They, you know, can't get to 10 wins again this year. But I don't know if it's worth anything. I just don't know how anybody could watch that football game, no matter what conference you're affiliated with, no matter what fan you are, and not think, I want those fans. I want that experience in my conference. I mean, that was awesome. Like, it, it was an awesome football game. Yeah, it sucks that Oregon State lost. But if you're looking at it from a neutral, or for the Beavs, that, that is, of course, it doesn't for the Huskies. But if you're looking at that from a neutral observer's perspective, which I would like to think I am in that particular matchup, it was an awesome football game. I was I was sitting on a bench on the field after the Southern Utah game, eating a Chick-fil-A sandwich, just simple, just you know, a little fried chicken between two buns, a couple slices of pickle, Chick-fil-A sauce, watching that game on my phone going, what an awesome game. What an awesome game. But Oregon State, their season goals cannot be reached this year. And that's really disappointing. And they end the Pac-12 era at Research Stadium with a loss like that. That's not a great feeling for Oregon State fans. And they have a chance to play spoiler once again for, for the Ducks this year. Oh, I suppose they can still get to 10 wins. My apologies. For some reason, I, I had Utah's record in my head, not Oregon State's. Excuse me for a moment. Some of you can probably tell I'm still battling um, a little bit of an of an illness, but <clears throat> a lot better than I was yesterday. I can tell you I'm a lot better than I was yesterday. I can tell you that. But um, so Oregon State can still get to to ten wins this year. My bad on on that. But they got to go to Oregon this week. That's really tough and. Winning that game against Washington would have meant everything to those fans in Corvallis and losing it is, is, is has got to feel pretty crushing. So let's transition into Chip Kelly because this is, I tell you what, are you going to fire Chip Kelly after he walks into Memorial Stadium with a second, third string caliber quarterback? And, and beats Lincoln Riley by 18 points on his home turf. Are you really going to do that? This is a team and a program that you are going to play every year as you go into the Big Ten. And the Bruins are sitting at 7-4. and four. No, it has not been the season UCLA fans were hoping for. It's been the exact one that I expected from them. So may, may, maybe that's why I was in the camp of, I don't know why Chip Kelly hot seat talk is coming up, but... I think it was the UCLA athletic director pushed back on that notion said, uh, or a big donor is like, no, that's overblown. It's clickbait and that's not happening. So I don't know how after that performance, I mean, he didn't just win the game. Chip Kelly outcoached Lincoln Riley. That is a flat out fact. I know it's in the same city, but on the road, Chip Kelly outcoached Lincoln Riley, beat him by 18 points. I don't know how you fire that guy. And, and I think that next year, you can say pressure's on. You got to deliver a 10-win season here. And Dante Moore has to play like a really high-end starting quarterback. I think that'd be totally fair. And I know the UCLA lost to Arizona State. was absolutely horrible and unacceptable. But, man, I tell you, I'd have a hard time firing a coach after – as a program, by the way – that treats basketball as, as its number one priority. That's its brand. It's crosstown rival values football and UCLA is the number two football team in its own city. And Chip Kelly has beaten USC again. I think that's the third time in his tenure that he's beaten USC. That's got to win some favor with the fans, at least enough to buy him a little bit of time. So 
I'm curious to say the least how that plays out. I won't be surprised if it comes out that, yeah, no, we're going to cheap, keep Chip Kelly for next year and ain't going to it with a lot of pressure on him. I think that would be a fair and reasonable way to act. What's fair and reasonable for the Pac-2? Well, what's fair doesn't actually happen to Oregon State and Washington State, but an interesting question about what they're going to do next. Here's an interesting question. Have you checked out FanDuel yet? No? Good. Now is a great time because you could score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. That's $150 bucks if your team wins. You can bet Notre Dame against Stanford this week. If it's first bet, $5, Notre Dame will win the game, and boom. 150 in bonus bets, just like that. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action. The app, super easy to use, great interface, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season and get your college football gambling fix done as well. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. All right, so if you ever have questions about anything, of course, YouTube comments or Twitter, hit me up at Smalls underscore 55 or at LO underscore Pac-12. Always love seeing what you guys are thinking about and talking about, or any girls out there thinking of watching, uh, or are watching, I should say, thinking of asking a question, by all means, send them in. Happens from time to time. There are female college football fans out there, and I appreciate all of you, no matter who you are. So this question came in from Tyler. What do Oregon State and Washington State do about basketball? for 2024 and 2025. And I think I'm, you know, kind of stretching the question to go out to, you know, the other sports as well. Quick note before I answer that, Tyler, there was a, an injunction, a motion filed in court by Oregon State and Washington State to say, hey, whatever the decision is going to be about who controls the Pac-12, who gets the assets, what the settlement's going to be, all that sort of stuff, they they received a ruling in favor of them in which they requested that there be finality by December 4th, which is when the transfer portal opens. So by December 4th, we should have a better idea. I don't know which day in there, right? That's anybody's guess. We can go back to guessing dates of the PAC 12 media deal. Remember those days where we all throwing proverbial darts at the board and landed on a particular day. You can do that again here with when, you know, this will all kind of finish up, but I think that sometime before that, I, I would guess it's got to take at least a couple of weeks to come to, to a settlement of sorts, but they want to know by December 4th so that they can tell their athletes before they you know put their name in the portal, hey, this is what we're going to plan to be doing. As to basketball and, and the rest of the sports, putting together a schedule as an independent for basketball is really easy. Football is tricky because football matchups – idiotically, are oftentimes scheduled many years in advance. Speaking of which, before I forget, the Apple Cup has been extended to 2028, which I think is awesome. I'm going to talk more about that on tomorrow's show, but I think that's good. I don't think every Washington State fan agrees. I hope Oregon and Oregon State do the same thing. I will talk about that more on, on tomorrow's show because that deserves a segment of its own. But for basketball and baseball, you know, there are other conferences that I'm sure would welcome Oregon State in those particular sports. And it's not unheard of for other random sports that are non-revenue sports to compete in a variety of conferences. So the school I work for, for instance, that I do play-by-play -play for, Southern Utah University, competes in the Western Athletic Conference. Now for football, the WAC doesn't have enough teams or didn't, so they merge with the ASUN and that forms the United Athletic Conference. So they compete in the WAC for all their sports, except football, which is in the UAC. And then gymnastics is in a conference of its own. And they just moved conferences, actually, because the MRGC dissolved after BYU went to the Big 12. So that is not uncommon. And I think for basketball in particular, it's really easy to find games. There are teams that college basketball scheduling is done the way I wish college football scheduling is done, which is on an annual basis before that season, looking at how to set up, you know, the best schedules and get great matchups and everything like that. College basketball does scheduling a thousand times better than college football, which is just a complete and utter mess. As I've long said here on the show for basketball, it's not hard to 
put together a schedule if you're operating as a pack two or de facto independent. That would be super, super manageable because when you move conferences, I'll go back to the Southern Utah example here. Southern Utah moved over to the WAC. You know who they play all the time in non-conference games? Former Big Sky foes. So our women's basketball team this year played Eastern Washington in the Big Sky. They've played, uh, you know, the men have played Montana State before. They've played Idaho State before. Idaho's come today. It's true in all sports. Like volleyball's got it. Like that can all be done and that can be arranged a lot easier than football because it's essentially just not quite as consequential where football plays and what banner they're operating under because that's the primary revenue generating sport for both of these schools and their athletic departments. That is what matters and what is complicated and what we're going to know by December 4th. But good question. So, and you know, for uh, sports like baseball, which matter, of course, tremendously to Oregon State, three national championships since I think 2006, they, you know, could go into like the Big West would would be an option. Maybe the, the American, I think, as baseball, um, heck, the whack geographically. I don't think the Mountain West has baseball. I'd have to look into that, but I'm pretty sure the Mountain West doesn't have baseball. So for sports like that, it's a lot more feasible, but they're going to wait and see what happens with football and then they'll make a decision. But there is a world in which football can operate independently, right? Like think about Notre Dame football. Another good example. Notre Dame is an independent football. Every other sport, literally everyone is in the ACC. I think that model is going to come about here for Oregon State and Washington State. They'll try and find a home for all their other sports maybe and then see where they can get in for football. Last thing here, and this question came in from Tyler as well. What are your thoughts on Carissa Thompson making up sideline reports? Pretty bonkers. <laughs> I mean, um, excuse me for a moment. Good thing I have a mute button on this mic or else I'd have to edit out that cough. Instead, it's just a couple of si seconds of silence for you. And it saves me the extra step. So Carissa Thompson, for those who are not aware, is currently a uh, studio host for Thursday Night Football. She's employed by Amazon now. I think she used to be at ESPN and or Fox once upon a time. I think Fox. And she admitted on a podcast that sometimes she wouldn't have the chance to talk to coaches going into or coming out of the half. So she would make things up based on what she knows a coach would probably say. Yeah, that's not okay. <laughs> like, and to admit that on a podcast, I think, means that she's clearly set in her job at Amazon and she's not doing sideline reporting anymore. Uh, I, I think it's insulting to the sideline reporters out there that do a lot of really good, honest work. But here's what I'll say as a broadcaster. I talk to coaches all the time, all the time. I'm always very clear when I have conversations with them, what's on the record, what's off the record. Cause there are statements that are on and off the record that happen in the conversations I've had with many coaches over the years. And never in a thousand years would I assume what a coach said. If I didn't have the chance to talk to coach, I am only going to operate based on what he or she has said previously or what he or she has told me previously, right? I'm not going to just make something like that was a crazy story. And I, 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 I don't understand. I, I do know why she said it because it gives – you know, look, we're talking about it here on this show. Um, it gives a level of authenticity and, you know, kind of behind the scenes to podcasts. And that can be really appealing there. And so she felt empowered to say that. But that's not a good thing to say. That's not a good thing to say. And I, I, I would never in a thousand years say something that a coach. I would never in, in, interpret a coach's statement in any way other than it was portrayed to me. And I would never say something and speak for a coach if it had not already been said. So that's my take on the matter. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.